Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 24th annual Plenderly Memorial Lecture. Um, we are here today, or rather this evening, with um, a human rights activist and Chancellor of Harriet Watt University, Sir Jeff Palmer. I'm Gwen Thomas, and I'm the Chair of ICON Scotland. Um, I'd just like to take a moment before introducing Sir Jeff, just to um, tell you a little bit about why we have this memorial lecture every year. Um, Dr. Harold Plenderly uh, is regarded widely as the father of conservation um, in our profession, and he was the Scottish Society for Conservation and Restoration's patron and honorary chair for many years. He was born in Dundee in 1898, and as an archaeologist, he was involved in the excavations of the tomb of Tutankhamun in Egypt, um, Sir Leonard Woolley cited Ur and the Sutton, and the Sutton Hoo ship burial. He went on to found the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research at the British Museum in 1924. After retirement in 1959, he became the first director of the International Centre for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in Rome, ICROM, where he served until 1971. He helped set up and then served on the Council of the International Institute for Conservation, IIC, from its creation in 1950 until 1971, and was IIC's president from 1965 to 1968. After his death in 1996, the SSCR, now Icon Scotland Group, established a successful annual public lecture in his memory, and speakers are generally leading figures in the world of conservation, heritage, archaeology, museums and galleries, and heritage in general. And so today we are going to speak with Sir Jeff Palmer. Uh, Sir Jeff actually is not, uh, does not have a background in heritage, but he is involved in a really important way at the moment. Um, he's a renowned scientist, human rights activist, professor emeritus in the School of Life Sciences at Harry Watt University, and he was the first black professor um, in Scotland. He regularly writes and speaks about Scotland's role in slavery and colonialism. He currently chairs the Scottish government, um, uh, Scottish government and coordinated by MGS's um, Empire, Empire, Slavery and Scotland's Museums Addressing Our Colonial Legacy Steering Group, um, which is coordinated by Museum Scotland. The project aims to explore how the history of Scotland's involvement in the British Empire, colonialism and transatlantic slavery can be told by Scotland's museums. He also chairs City of Edinburgh Council's advisory panel on Edinburgh's slavery and colonial legacy. Um, welcome, Sir Jeff. I shall hand over to you. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And um, I, I, some of what I will say, um, you know, might sound like conservation in a sense that it, it's about keeping our history in context. And of course, if one changes things like take statues down or, you know, change name plates, then we are. Um, you know, changing the context of our history. And therefore I'm, you know, I'm not in favor of that. Um, however, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, now, how did I arrive here today? In fact, giving you a lecture. Now, I was born in Jamaica, you know, quite a little while ago in, in 1940. And um, my mom and my dad left the country, you know, where they lived. Um, they lived in two little parishes. One was called St. Elizabeth and the other one was called Manchester. And I was born in St. Elizabeth. Now we went and lived in Kingston, which is the capital. And it, it, Jamaica is like some of the places where if you say to a Jamaican, where, where did you, you know, where do you come from? A, a lot of people would say Kingston, even like myself, I was born in the country um, because being from the country um, is a, a little bit of um, negativity um, in terms of being in the country because that means you might not be very sophisticated. So I lived in Kingston and that is, is, is true. Now, my father, um, for all kinds of reasons, you know, left the family in 1947. I, he went off to America. And, 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 and the, you may say that sounds very casual, but 
if you come from a culture which is a, a post um, chattel slavery culture where there were um, you know hardly any social rules uh, as far as the the slaves were concerned you do uh, as you were told and and therefore he he left and we never saw him again in fact I never saw him again until 1975 so he left in 1947 and I didn't see him again until 1975 by accident in New York when I was given a lecture uh, uh, at a science conference on barley he suddenly turned up but that's uh, another story the point is we lived in Kingston um, from uh, in the 40s and uh, in 1951 my mother left me with her sisters and came to London in 1951 now that was not an uncommon practice mothers um you know would travel in terms of as migrant to the united states or to britain and would leave their children with their sisters um and you know sisters had that responsibility to look after their sisters children now my aunts i, I can't remember how many they were it could be six seven or, or, you know they were quite a few of them it all we were all living in one house with a grand aunt um, and the grand aunt was a, a bit of um, a mystery in terms of who she was I knew nothing about her I still don't but it was her house and we all lived in her house and she was lighter skin in color than we were but you know that didn't appear to me as important until I left Jamaica in Jamaica it was just auntie um, and she ran the house with a rod of iron and my aunts who were grown women um, did everything she said so did I um, and we lived in that house and the main focus uh, that I can remember was you know going to church on a Sunday you know um, we went to church three times on a Sunday morning service I went to Sunday school and my aunts joined me for night service so that was a Sunday and the Sundays were very critical in terms of our way of life and again <clears throat> coming from a slavery culture people find that surprising that in Jamaica the religion is is a very important part of the people's lives and and I left Jamaica so I, I left my school and my church um, which was at North Street and Princess Street that's where my church was located and I never realized the significance or importance of the Scottish connection in Princess Street however um, my mother as I said came in 51 and she worked saved enough money to bring me here in 1955 she sent 86 pounds to her sisters they bought my ticket and when I was leaving on the, the on the night in 1955 my grand aunt called me over to a rocking chair ordered that I took my shirt off and she wrapped my chest in note in newspaper that she was reading and she tied it with string told me to put my shirt back on which I did and I took my suitcase my small suitcase with all my belongings in it and I was driven to the airport which I'd never seen um, I've only ever seen planes flying above I've ne never ever been near one and um, I was deposited at the airport and that was it I had to find my way to Paddington that was the instruction I had so I'm at the um, Palisades airport in Kingston given instructions that I must eventually meet my mother in Paddington um, I'd not traveled out of Jamaica before that I was you know nearly 15 years of age 
So <clears throat> I got on the plane, got to New York. I think it stopped off at Florida first and they questioned us whether we were communist or not. I think that was the usual procedure getting into America then. And we got back on the plane and we went to New York and at New York, um, I, uh, I took a bus, which was the airport bus, which was managed by um, a police um, and they transported us from the plane to the ship. The name of my ship was Ascania. So I got on the ship and the ship took me to Liverpool. Um, the irony is my grandaunt wrapped me in newspaper because she thought the journey was only going to take about 24 hours. So when I got on the ship in New York, when I knew she couldn't um, uh, complain, um, I took the newspaper off um, in, 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 in New York. I arrived in, in Liverpool on, I think, the 3rd of March, 1955. I didn't know where um, uh, Paddington was, so I walked around the street with my little suitcase and I asked people, could they tell me where Paddington was? And somebody said I had to get a train. So I got a train and eventually I got to Paddington. And a lady came up, grabbed me by the shoulder and said, follow me, I'm your mother. Now, there were no hugs or kisses because that's the sort of thing we did. Um, and she took me home in Islington in her room in the attic. Um, she just had one room and she had a bed up for me and she fed me. I went to my bed and the next morning she woke me up and said, to my shock and surprise, you're going to work. Now, I had no idea what I'd come to Britain for. Um, however, my mother now had informed me that I was here to work to help her. I think she was earning about three pounds a week at the time. However, um, I got dressed, had breakfast and she, we got to the door and there was a man standing at the door and the man told my mother, um, you know, that this boy who's just arrived, he's on my list and um, where are you taking him? And my mom said, he's going to work. And the man said, you can go to work with, he can't, he's not 15. And my mom says, this is March and his birthday is April. So it's about a month. I'll keep him at home for a month. And the man said, no, I don't make the rules. He's got to go to school. And that was the first decision in the UK in terms of my education, the immigration officer at the door, demanding that I finish my education or just not education, it's just go to school until I was 15 because those were the rules. I had, you know, I went to the church school in Jamaica. Um, so the school I went to wasn't, um, it was what we would basically call elementary. Um, I was, my mom took me to the local school in Islington near where she lived and they gave me a test and, and, and came to the conclusion that I was educationally subnormal. I think one of the questions on the paper was, what was Big Ben and its importance? Now, I had no idea who Big Ben was. I thought it was a big bloke. <laughs> However, I didn't do very well. And um, I was told to go to a secondary modern school, which was nearby, near Holloway Women's Prison at, 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 the, at the time, where the prison was. I don't know where it is now. So I went to Shelburne and the headmaster decided that he would not take me for a month. He would take me for the following term, the summer term. Unfortunately, he did that. So it's another person in my life who was making a decision, not on me having any expectations. I just wanted to finish the month. 
Um, so my mom had to agree to that. And fortunately, it was the summer term because I played cricket and the local games master saw me, took me for a trial and came the next morning and said, you're playing for London. So I was picked to represent London after I'd been in the country about a couple of months. Um, and that was very important in my education because the Islington Gazette published that I was playing for London. The fixtures were Eton, Harrow, Winchester, which I thought they, I had no idea what they were as schools. In fact, I told my mom the boys were poor because they were wearing straw hats. So I played my cricket. It appeared in the Islington Gazette and the local grammar school headmaster rang my school, Shelburne Road Secondary Mod, and demanded that I was transferred to Highbury County Grammar School. Of course, my mom and I wasn't very, you know, we weren't very happy about this. However, the headmaster at the secondary mod school persuaded us and said it was a good opportunity for me. So I went to Highbury County, played my cricket, stayed there from 1955 until 1958. I left Highbury County. Um, I had maybe one O level um, or two or, or maybe two or three, I can't remember. Um, but I had one a, a, a level, not very good grade in, I think, biology. I was keen on biology. I wasn't good at anything else, um, I, th I thought. So I went and worked at Queen Elizabeth's College in London. Um, that's part of London University. And Professor Chapman, who took me, he came into the room, saw me sitting there in 1958. He asked me what my name was. And I said, Godfrey Henry Oliver Palmer, because my name isn't Jeff. <laughs> and Chapman said, um, if I can call you Jeff, you can have the job. And I said, that's OK with me. So that's how I got to work at London University's Queen Elizabeth College. And I worked there from 1958. And my mom and myself were having struggles um, with our accommodation, you know, being given notice to move. And I had to do all the legal work by going to the library and reading up the, you know, the, um, the law on furnished and unfurnished tenancy, because the law about whether you had a right to stay or not depended on whether you were furnished, partly furnished or unfurnished. So um, Chapman recognised that I was having difficulties with something. And the fortunately for us, he did, because the landlord had turned the water off in the middle of London, so we had no water in order to get us out. And we had to go next door and collect water. However, he, he asked me what the problems were, I told him. And he said, I want you to go to university by 1961. This is 1958. Um, and he <clears throat> gave me time off. And by 1961, I had four A-levels and six O-levels. And um, I couldn't get into any university. I applied and those I applied to rejected me. And when Chapman asked me which university I was going to in 1961, I said, I'm not going anywhere. And he sent me out his room. And in a few minutes, he came out and said, you're going to Leicester University. And he must have telephoned the university and got me in. So I got to Leicester University in 1961. And I got an honours degree in botany in 64. Um, with an honours degree in botany, I went back to London and I um, tried to find a job and I couldn't find a job. So I went to the Labour Exchange and they gave me two jobs, one um, in a betting shop and the other was peeling potatoes in Beale's restaurant at Nags Head. So I took the peeling potatoes job because I thought it was closer to botany. Um, 
I worked at Beals from June 1964. And then in December 1964, I had two significant interviews. One was with a very famous politician. And he, um, um, as soon as I walked into the room, he was there with the professors from Reading University and, and I think Nottingham. And he, as soon as I sat down, he said, why don't you go back to where you come from and grow bananas? And again, in those days, the, it's not about emotion. It's about just a, a response. It's about your sense of belonging and your rights. So you were fighting for rights, even though you didn't know that's what you were doing. You just felt somebody had said something to me, which was unpleasant. And I was going to respond. So um, I just said in reply, it's, it's difficult to grow bananas in, 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 in Haringey, to which we had moved to. So I was telling him, I'm, I'm going nowhere. You know, I come from a British colony. And that colony has been part of, 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 of Britain or, or England, stroke Britain, since 1655. 1655 and I knew that and that was my sense of belonging and nobody was going to shift me no matter I think he was the most is the second most powerful politician in the country at the time I then saw an advert for Edinburgh and um, I applied and it was a PhD at which I had to work at Harriet Watt but because Harriet Watt was a college then my PhD is technically not Harriet Watt, it's Edinburgh University. So I registered at Edinburgh, but as, as the rules said that, but I worked with Professor Anna McLeod, who took me um, to do the PhD, and she's a wonderful woman. She's got a hall of residence named after her at Rickerton in the Harriet Watt campus at present. And she, again, like the other people, you know, the man at the door or the um, uh, Mr. Bulling, the headmaster at the secondary modern school, or Mr. King, the headmaster at the, the grammar school, or Professor Chapman at Queen Elizabeth's College. He, you know, um, Anna took me when she started telling me about the research, and I had no idea about barley or whiskey or beer. Um, she stopped and she said, I'm going to take you anyway, because when I was telling you all that, you were honest enough to be looking out the window. And that means two things. She says, you won't bother me. And two, you, I think you be able to cope with the work. Now, how she knew that, I don't know. But you see, it was what was called wider access. She had checked on my background and she was looking, uh, she looked at the degree of difficulty that or, you know, the degree of difficulties I had arriving for that interview. She never said it, but I knew she did that. And that is critical if you are looking at somebody. It's what I call culture consciousness. At least I just made up those two words the other day. It's culture consciousness. And Anna was very good at that. She took me, gave me a bit of barley, and that was 1964, and I got... I started in January 1965 and I got my PhD in 1967. Doing research on barley, which was significant enough that it changed the concept of how people think the barley grain, um, you know, um, changed itself into malt. This was the science of germination and what we call malt modification. So the PhD work was important in that regard. I think my second publication was in Nature which is the, you know, so-called top journal. If you've got anything new, it tends to go in nature. And we got our second paper in nature. I think that was about 67. I, I left um, Edinburgh in 1968 after doing a postdoc. I went and worked for the brewers in the Brewing Research Foundation in Surrey. And that was a very elite research institute near Redhill. 
and um, Anna advised me to, to, to go there if I could get in and I applied and I got in. Um, and, and, and I'm sure Anna helped in terms of um, uh, helping me to secure the position. So I went in as a scientist in 1968. And I stayed there from 68 until 77, 1968 to 1977. And during that period, I used the scientific um, concepts and ideas which I had during my PhD to develop um, an industrial process called barley abrasion. And if you look on your phone, just type barley abrasion in and it will tell you the, the, the process. It was very successful. The, the big brewers like Bass and Allied Breweries were using the development of that concept. So I started with 20 grains, 20 grains. And we developed it into an industrial concept where the machines were treating 20, I think it was 10 tons an hour, each machine was abrading 10 tons an hour, starting with 20 grains as a concept. And I think Bass Charrington's had about eight of those machines working 24 hours a day. So again, that I, I started my scientific career at the Harriet Watt as such, and then um, developed it in, in, in industry in terms of technology. And in my book, Scientific, uh, um, which I did at a scientific, book um, on, on, on barley and malting, uh, on the strap line in the book, which is called Serial Science and Technology. On the strap line in the book, it says technology is science that work. And that's a concept which I developed to do my work. Technology is science that works and it applies to everyday life. If you're doing something and it isn't working, the science is wrong. Um, if your car doesn't start, the science is wrong. And I left the Brewing Research Foundation, as I said, in 1977. I went there in 68, left in 77, came back to the Harriet Watt when um, Anna McLeod, Professor McLeod retired in 77. And I worked at the Harriet Watt teaching and doing research from 1977 until 2005. And during that period, I taught some of the, you know, wonderful, people, students. And, um, you know, when I go into supermarkets and look at the beer counter, not all of them went into brewing, um, because brewing is a scientific degree. Um, but those who went into brewing, an example is one of the owners of the brew dog company is my student. Also Stuart Brewing in Edinburgh, he is my student. And um, there are many others all over the world. You know, I traveled the world um, from Japan, South America to North America, over Europe, Africa, um, and India, all talking about the science of cereal. Um, that's a sort of my academic sort of um, background in terms of my, 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 my life from the, the, the Ascania in Liverpool in 1955 to 2005 when I retired. There are one or two things I did at the Harriet Watt where, as I said, I taught some exceptional students. Um, and also in the 1980s, the Harriet Watt we were in some trouble because the government was thinking of closing the brewing. Um, department and other departments around the country, which they regarded as not significant in terms of income, research, um, um, and, and important to, 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 to the country, which for brewing is not very wise because the brewing industry and the distilling industries are two of the most significant, and the malting industry, three of the most significant industries in the country. However, that it was on the cards, so I got in my car, went to Ellerslie Road in Edinburgh to speak to the boss of United Distillers, who I knew. 
And after a short discussion with him, he told me to go away and write my plans for a new brewing department at the Harriet Watt. I hadn't told the principal nor my boss. And the Harriet Watt was then at Chamber Street, you know, in the courts where the law courts, courts is at the moment. And I wrote a plan and that plan, Ronnie Martin accepted it, took it to the Scotch Whiskey Association, with whom I have contacts still today. And they gave him one million pounds. And the brewers came in with 400,000. So we used about 1.4 million and we built the international center for brewing and distilling at the Harriet Watt. We debated on the title because brewing, we could have called it the department of, 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 of brewing and distilling, um, but we wanted the name international because we wanted to have a department that wasn't sort of parochial. We wanted it to be open to the world. And the Harriet Watt today, we have a concept, what we call the One Watt concept. And we have campuses in Dubai and Malaysia. So um, that's one of the things I was involved in at the, the Harriet Watt. So not just teaching, but help to develop what was is called the International Center for Brewing and Distilling. Now, in terms of my community work, even though I was teaching at the Harriet Watt, I did use some of my time to be a visitor at the Scottish prisons with Lady Cullen. I, 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 uh, I was invited to join her um, to visit prisons, to talk to prisoners, which, which I did and, and, and found it very important. Um, taking the problems of young men especially, and women from Court and Vale to the governors in order to make life a bit better for the prisoners. And I, I did that for about five years while I was at the Harriet Ward. And I joined various community organizations and various people asked me to sit on board. So I kind of a housing, housing for older people. The CAB, um, Assistant Advice Bureau, um, LREC, which is the quality race equality organization. Um, I'm still on, the, on those. Um, and, you know, various other organizations which I've helped in one way or the other. But if we now come to recent, um, uh, my contribution to, you know, since the death of George Floyd, um, um, it, 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 that turned the heads of people who did not notice race before. Um, and the, the way I've approached that is to say to people, tell me why I'm a different race from you. And I want an answer in five seconds. If you can't do that, then we've got a word which has destroyed the lives of millions of people and you can't tell me what it means scientifically, why I'm different from you and why I've been subjected to being my ancestors anyway, uh, to be chattel slaves who had no right to life and were property legally, legally. So when slavery was um, abolished or the slaves were emancipated, the slave owners were given 20 million. That's about 17, 20 billion today for their property, for which they were entitled. That's what the document says. And the point is that I tend to start with the word race. And it, 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 it came about into significance when David Hume got up one morning in 1748 and said, Negroes are inferior to whites. He said that no matter how clever and important people think he is or he was, that's what he said. And Kant picked that up and tack the word race onto that statement. So we now have the Negro race is inferior 
to the white race or other races for that matter. The point is that that is the academic basis of racism. It's a myth, it's a lie, it's not true. But nevertheless, it was used to drive slavery because it was saying there's a justification for it. You know, an academic justification. These people are inferior, so we can enslave them. And the point is that Britain ended up in, in say 1800, Britain had 800,000 slaves in the Caribbean, 800,000. There were 300,000 in Jamaica. And the point is that I am a descendant of that. My family still, part of my family anyway, still live on a section of Earl Balcaris, Balcaris Street in Edinburgh. They still live on a section of Earl Balcaris's slave plantation called Marshall Payne. So if you type in Marshall Payne on your phone, you will get Earl Balcaris's slave plantation. And I say, part of my family still lives there and I visited it, so I know it. Um, if you look at the Jamaica telephone directory, over 60% of the names in the Jamaica telephone directory are Scottish surname. And I use that to, without saying very much, because that says a lot in terms of that evidence, that over 60% of the names in the Jamaica telephone directory are Scottish surnames. The point is that quite, since Floyd's dead, people have come to me where, because I've said, you know, with the Coulston statue and the other statue that was taken down, what were my views on that? And I said, no, I think statues should remain. I made a comment that the next statue we take down should be racism. You should not remove a part of history from its context. If you take down Henry Dundas statue in the middle of Edinburgh, this is what you're removing. Henry, the, the, the headquarters of the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is just across the road, that very large building is Lawrence Dundas's house. And that's Henry Dundas who's on the statue. That's his relative. And standing in front of um, the, that grand Dundas house is a statue of the Earl of Hopeton. And the Earl of Hopeton and Dundas are, 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 are relatives because Dundas is married into the Earl of Hopeton's family. And across the road from Dundas's statue is where Henry Brougham lived. And Henry Brougham was a significant um, abolitionist. And behind Dundas is the British Linen Bank, which provided clothes for Britain's slaves in the Caribbean. And that was an enormous business. If you have to clothe 800,000 slaves, that was a very important, successful business. So therefore in that one little area, you know, um, that history is there. And if you take that statue down, you're removing the context of that history. So I made a point of saying, I've been trying to get Henry Dundas's statue to remain, but what I wanted was a, his plaque to be changed because his plaque was saying quite, they thought quite rightly that he was a powerful politician. He was Secretary of State for War, he was the Home Secretary, he was President of the Board of Control, that means he controlled India and the Far East. He also, in fact, managed the West Indies, he selected the governors, he sent Earl Balcaris to Jamaica as a governor. Um, he sent Nini and Home as a governor to, uh, other Caribbean, uh, to another Caribbean island. And therefore, in fact, Dundas also attacked Haiti losing 40,000 British troops in 80 in the effort to destroy the French slavery industry so it didn't compete with the British slavery industry in Jamaica. He also gradually abolished the slave trade, stopping Wilberforce from doing it for 15 years. He also transported Scottish martyrs, that's another thing he did. And also he was impeached for taking the Navy's money he and Trotter, 
there's a big T on the Pentland Hills. That those are the that's the Tota tree. It's really a uh, a Greek cross, but every side you look at it, it's a T, and that's Trotter, who was Dundas's clerk. And Trotter siphoned money to Dundas from the Navy that's defending the country. And therefore, my view to the council was, and another chap called Adam Ramsey, was that Dundas's plaque should be changed to reflect his role in slavery. It was hard work, it took over three years. However, Floyd's death helped because that accelerated the process. And only about three weeks, a month ago, a new plaque is on Henry Dundas' statue in St. Andrew's Square, and it says, he gradually abolished the slave trade, causing over half a million Africans to be transported into slavery. And his plaque is dedicated to those who suffered. The trade's house in, um, in Glasgow have, have spoken to me about this, but the, the merchant's house, I've put up a plaque in the merchant's house, declaring their connections with slavery, and their plaque is also dedicated to those who suffered. And Glasgow University has done the same, where they have looked at their history and said they've received about 200 million from slavery. And in the church, in the university, they've got to plaque up stating that that area of the university was belonged to a slave owner and that they received money from slavery, which was donated to the university. And they've got a plaque also dedicated to those who suffered. So I know of three plaques, which are up in Scotland, declaring the truth. No manipulations, no trying to say the Joseph Knight case abolished slavery in Scotland, or miners were also slaves and salters were slaves. These people were in servitude, though they were servants. You should not compare evil. Evil should be addressed separately. Because once you try to compare what, or moderate, what you're trying to do is to negate the claims of people um, on any side. And therefore, the slavery in the Caribbean was chattel. It was legal. And the point is that uh, people have said to me, but that's the past. And the past is critical. You're in the past. You're dealing with the past. You're trying to conserve the past in many ways. And that is important because what I said about that, which has been used by other people, I said, we cannot change the past. But we can change the consequences. The consequences. Such as racism for the better using education. And therefore, if you take a statue down, you know, if you remove the evidence, you remove the deed. If you remove the evidence, you're trying to remove the deed. And therefore, the past must remain. You know, I'm involved in a situation that appears, may appear in the Times tomorrow where there is a pub, I think it's in Linlisco, where, you know, people are trying to change the name of the pub, you know, it's called the Black Bitch. And I had to point out that a bitch is a female dog, not a black woman. And, but the owners of the pub want to change it because they think they're doing you know, um, they think they're doing me a favor. And th th that's not doing a favor for black people because if you change that name, you are actually saying a black person is called a black bitch. And this is sometimes the lack of thinking that some people who mean well um, can carry out. And therefore that sign should remain because it's referring to a story about a dog. Um, and there are other things, you know, where people are trying to change slave trade into trafficking. It's a nonsense. Trafficking is 
illegal. The slave trade was legal. And therefore tampering and, 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 and moderating the past. It, it's either, you know, some people say they're doing it because they mean well. No, it should remain. Um, it, 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 it should remain because it is part of our history. And some of it it is also tells us what we're capable of doing. And, 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 and somehow it's educational. And finally, you know, the, as I said, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences using education. And therefore I feel that education is critical in, 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 in this history. I think also too, you know, we must become system conscious. That if we live in a system, uh, and I, this applies to black people as well as white people. And just an example of how system consciousness can be used, whereby in the NHS, in, 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 in a sector of Edinburgh and the Lothians, there were only four BME nurses who were managers. And I was asked about that and we looked at it and I, I've got a little term again, another term I've, I've made up, it's called system consciousness. And we applied that to, to the training to make people aware of the expectations of the system, whether they're right or wrong, that people should be made aware of them. Um, and within three years, we went from four managers to over 20. So it's not what Hume says, you know, it's genetics and what I think the, the psychologist in the 50s was trying to say with his IQ test. He was trying to prove Hume scientifically. The point is that we are one humanity, one humanity, nothing less. Different, but the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Jeff. That was uh, really interesting and uh, moving, uh, but also funny. Um, there were some really good stories in there, and. I said, I feel like I want to come up with some kind of really intelligent question, but it's really, it's not about questions and answers. It is about a conversation mm -hmm. um, and sort of back and forth. Um, I mean, I'm certainly trying to work out which uh, which politician you went into for an interview <laughs> with. I was just like, okay, so hang on, who was prime minister in 1964? Okay, um, um, but uh, I'll put that to one side. I, I, I will tell you because you could go on the computer. I did a program called Life Scientific and I mentioned it in there. Um, the spectator wasn't very happy about it in, in 2015. <laughs> um, it was the case chosen. Okay. That's right. Okay. I, and, it, you know, it was, but then Suki said all sorts of things about different people at that time. <laughs> you know, so the, the, the guy who went, after me, went in after me at the interview, he asked him, and this was one of the top chemists from Cambridge, he actually asked him, what's the chemical composition of dirt? <laughs> okay. And the guy was very emotional and it threw him, I wasn't. <laughs> okay well there you go I think that's actually that's really interesting about the the emotional thing yeah. that you you talk very clearly about you know emotion doesn't come into it you, you know you are making basically factual decisions given the set of circumstances that you, you have and I was actually reminded of uh I I went for an interview at Cambridge University when uh, I was 18 and um, they asked me, I'm Welsh and Welsh is my first language and I went to a Welsh school and my essays that I submitted were in Welsh and um, in the interview they asked me what was the point of Welsh history and I got really upset and really flustered and I probably totally like mangled that interview um, because I was so upset by having that kind of 
my my heritage sort of questions but actually <laughs> but actually if i had if i had responded as they probably would have was what they were expecting rather than being insulting you know to be rational as you said about saying well explain to me in five seconds what the difference is between between races um that would have made a lot more sense than just taking it really personally but actually just laying out your your case um makes makes a lot of sense um i just wanted to say to the audience also we have a q a function if you do have any questions or or uh, comments that you'd like um you'd like to uh, put to uh, Sir Jeff, you're very welcome to do that. Um, I suppose we talked quite a lot about the, um, Dun you talked a lot about the Dundas statue and I have been involved um, in that group as well. Um, how do you feel about, as you say, it took three years to get that plaque, but how do you feel about the progress that is being made in Scotland to address these legacies and be more honest about them rather than trying to, as you say, obliterate them? I think in Scotland, you know, I to, 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 to cover that, I was speaking to a, a black historian in, in the Caribbean in, in one, a, a sort of a, 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 a joint meeting. And at the end of the meeting, and she's very radical in terms of her, 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 her politics. And she said, you know, why is Scotland so far ahead in addressing this history? So people are watching what we're doing, for example, with the statue, what Glasgow University has done, what Aberdeen has is, 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 is done in terms of with the, with the Benning bronze. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, just in general, the work, you know, I've been doing on other people. Um, and, you know, Scotland, for example, the Toronto, I've still got to respond to the most recent correspondence, but I've been in, they've been in touch with me twice about um, how to manage their work in terms of looking at Dundas Street, which is a significant street in Toronto, and also historical links between Dundas and Toronto. And they're asking us. So it, it you know, we are, and we've got committees, as you've mentioned, with the, the Edinburgh Council, the Scottish Government and, Ed and Edinburgh University is also looking at this. So we um, uh, um, uh, uh, are a long way ahead. And a lot of Scottish people are very positive about this because many of the lectures I've given, they've asked me, why hasn't anybody told them this before? Mm. They are astonished, the Scottish people, as to the extent of Scotland's involvement. I, I think, yes, Avery I think that's that's a really good point. I think that um, in, in Wales and, and in Scotland, because there's sort of a, a feeling that in, you know, in some ways, you know, we are colonies of England, that doesn't preclude people from those countries have being involved in slavery and, to, you know, enslaving people to quite a significant extent. Um, and, uh, but it's just not something that is necessarily taught, or in fact, hardly ever is is taught. Certainly not in schools. Um, yeah, that's and so I think that does lead on to one of the questions that we've had actually, um, in terms of what museums and galleries uh, and you know heritage in general can do. Um, Bethany says, "Thank you for sharing your story. I was very interested in your idea of changing how history is presented rather than erasing the evidence." How do you think museums and galleries can better approach how history is presented? Well, uh, you know, I'm <clears throat> I'm on the museum committee. I'm, I'm chairing that, um, and I, I think that one of the ways is that the people who work in museums, you know, how much of this history do you really know? Mm -hmm. uh, because you probably have um, items relating to this history. And the point is that um, in the past, I think people have been a bit timid in terms of, you know, um, becoming familiar with this history. I don't know, there are various reasons why people, uh, some of them emotional, why people are a bit sort of nervous to do this. And the museums themselves um, should look at themselves and decide 
that they can be much more positive in terms of having exhibitions or um, um, discussions or inviting people in, in order to educate not only the people who work in the museums, but also the general public. Mm -hmm. It's about education. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, we have done in my museum service, uh, one of the curators at the Museum of Childhood, we have an awful lot of gollywogs in the Museum of Childhood, yeah. as you might imagine. We have a lot of lots of strange things, but we have a lot we have a lot of racist things actually in the Museum of Childhood. Mm -hmm. so it's not that surprising. Um, but the gollywogs, instead of being scattered around the galleries, they're actually in one space together now, so that the, and they do have one specific um, interpretation to go with them to so that we're not hiding. The we haven't taken them off display, but mm. we're trying to provide a context for why, you know, why they're in the collection. Um, and as you say, to educate, um, hopefully, anyway, people don't just see it and feel offended. Um, Mary uh, has commented, um, fabulously insightful and thought provoking talk. I wonder how you feel about the justification used by some in relation to many injustices and inequalities that simply those were different times. Yes, this is why I said, you know, people will say that's the past, but you've got to say, what about the consequences? The past is about consequences. And, and, and therefore, you know, in terms of they were different times, it's almost denigrating people in the past. You know, we still have the Ten Commandments <laughs> and mm. that's the past. <laughs> You know, a lot of what we do, we read a lot of Burns stuff, that's the past. You know, we read Shakespeare, that's the past. We haven't got anything as, as good today. <laughs> and therefore, the, we, our, our culture is passed on. It's not the past. We behave in terms of our culture of yesterday. And therefore, culture, as I said, we should become cultures, culture conscious and realize that our behaviors and our attitudes, we are still thinking what Hume told us. And we can mm. express it in different ways. Like Nabarro, you know, the politician in the 60s, he said, how would you like a big black guy to bring home your little blonde, your little blonde daughter to bring home a big black guy? And he won his seat. And Griffiths, you know, the politician who said, if you want an N-word person for a neighbor, vote Labour. And two years ago, I went into Edinburgh to give a talk and the young lady said, what, what time is your talk? And I said, two o'clock. And she said, two o'clock? Well, you can't be giving that talk because that talk has been given by Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. <laughs> oh. That's right. And, and that was and only that, two years ago. That's, two years ago. Yeah, that's horrifying. And I, I you know, the, I was speaking to a couple of, of, of elderly ladies in my village and, and, and one of them was trying to tell her that this, you know, who I was. And she kept saying, does he sing? <laughs> Do you? Yeah, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, those are the prejudices and some people believe they don't have them. But, you know, um, when Is I was- that was a, is that a print? I, that's really baffling to me uh, that somebody would ask that. It, sorry, continue. Yeah, because black people sing, they're not professors. Right, okay. That's, and therefore, that's the prejudice. It is prejudging. And that's, we, and we yeah. do that and don't even understand it. <laughs> we are yeah. prejudged. And when you put that prejudgment into action, it's discrimination. And therefore, yeah. people don't even understand that. It is prejudging. Yeah, so it's, it's also then a, a need to help not just educate in terms of history, but educate people to become, for us to become more aware of our own prejudices, which we do all have. And that self-awareness that, you know, that you, you might need to act against your own natural prejudices, not natural, but, you know, ingrained. Um, yeah. yeah. It's in your yeah. country. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, and, and this happens at interviews. This is how people act. This is why I said with the, with the NHS, we change that by, you know, 
making the interviewers aware of their prejudices. Mm. So for example, a Chinese person comes in and he doesn't do the eye contact, but then he doesn't do that or she doesn't do it because that's not in their culture. It's disrespectful. Yeah, so unconscious bias is something that we really do have to work to. No, make there's no such thing. Okay, yes, no, well, I guess not unconscious, but you know, it's like it's sort of your own prejudices. Um, yeah, and yeah. you're just right, your cultural prejudices. And yeah. People do use the word unconscious bias, and I used to say, how do anybody know it's unconscious? No, that's a very good point, very good point. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we... Like, you know, therefore, we have a society where people just say anything, you know, and yes. the point is that, um, and, 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 and therefore, and this is, is quite okay, but what it does, we have a society that still think that, you know, um, yes, this is my opinion, and it, they have no evidence for this opinion. The point is, yes, that's it, perfectly fine. But I usually say to my students, you know, we should have evidence um, in order to make sure that we don't make judgments which harm people. And I give them the example that there are two planes on the runway. One is built by somebody who's of the opinion they can build a plane. The other one is trained to build a plane. Which one would you fly in? So people uh, have opinions yeah. as long as it isn't going to kill them. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, you, opinions are valid, but it doesn't make them facts. Yeah. They, opinions, opinions are, 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 if they're not evidence-based, then that's a social construct. That isn't um, um, a, a, a construct based on, on, on how our society work practically. Hmm. You know, I can say, well, I, I don't know anything about it, but my view is so and so. And that's fine, as long as you don't have to fly in it. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of more questions, if that's okay. okay. No problem. Yeah. Um, so Heather's question, uh, Heather, is, her section of conservation is historic mm -hmm. interiors. Over yeah. the last few years, I've become aware that the slaves in the West Indies financed the majority of the beautiful 18th century houses and their interior furnishing. I find uh -huh. it hard to reconcile that the high skills of such makers as Chippendale and Whitty were enabled by the suffering of others. How can this be balanced? Well, how can it be balanced is to, is to um, make sure that the, the society knows about it and that when people come to visit, you, you have a proper debate or discuss or, or, or you know, um, or, or um, information, whether it's on a plaque or whether it's a notice or it's discussed. I was looking at a program the other night, which is, um, you know, which is called, what they call it, Flog It. Yes. Uh, I can't remember the name of the house, but it, it, it was a house where the two original owners were notorious slave traders. And that wasn't mentioned. You know, um, the, the point is that and in Scotland, as, as the questioner says, there are houses which, in fact, like um, Inverness Lodge, that was owned by James Weatherburn, and he, he, he bought it with the money he made in slavery. A lot of the houses in the new town, um, the Gallery of Modern Art, it's a slave master's house. The point, I didn't know that. Well, th there you go. It's a slave owner's house. And therefore, the, the necropolis is a slave owner's graveyard, James Ewing. Now, the point is that we therefore have a society where people are walking up and down, touching, and they have no idea. So they have very little regard, and it isn't looked at with a seriousness that it deserves. For example, um, um, the Jamaica Street in Glasgow. How old do you think it is? When do you think it was formed? Can anybody say? Oh, question for the audience there. Anyone can say it in the <laughs> chat. <laughs> when, when it was open. And just in case, I'll just say we don't have the time. It's 1763. Okay. If anybody got that, you get a documentation Mars bar. <laughs> That's right. 1763. And therefore, the people in Glasgow realised the, 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 the economic significance of Jamaica at that time. 
1763. That's not long after the Union. Yeah. And, and it's embedded in the Union. Article 4 gave the Scots permission to join the plantations in the Dominion, 1707. So therefore we have a history which the Scottish people want, but the people who are managing our society and who have a, a responsibility probably to do that because those attitudes when changed will improve our representation, will improve our relationship. And a diverse society needs diverse management to be fair and efficient. A diverse society requires diverse management to be fair. And, efficient. and I'll give you a little example of that. In the 1980s, the Guinness Company had a problem in Nigeria. They had four breweries there, which were making more money than the breweries in, in London and Dublin. So they asked me to go to Nigeria, and I did. And I, you know, sorted out the problem, told them to use the local African grain rather than rely on European grain, which the government had banned. And that concept is now all over Africa, um, where the small farmers growing sorghum have got big companies and it's highly sustainable now, where before it was variable. The point is that when Guinness made that choice, they chose me, not a white person, because they assessed that I had the capacity to sort the problem out. That's the importance of diversity. And any big organization, that's what one should start looking at. Look around your office and see how diverse it is. I think actually that ties in really well. We've got a couple of questions that are kind of okay. a similar kind of thing, and it does. Okay. Yeah, lead on from that and also what you were saying about the NHS and MBA ME nurses uh, yeah. in supervisory and managerial roles. Mm -hmm. um, Helen says, thank you for sharing your history. Can I ask, are there things we can do to increase diversity among conservators? And um, also, uh, Katie says, do you think relatively low wages in the heritage sector are a barrier to the workforce diversity in terms of class and national background? And I think this is something that probably everybody in this audience is very aware of that the, the uh, conservation workforce profile is uh, very heavily skewed uh, white, middle class and increasingly female. Um, not that there's anything wrong with any of those things individually. And obviously you want people who uh, you know, are trained to do a job, as you were saying, with the, you know, the, the, uh, the pilot of a plane. But, um, but how do we, is there a, do you have any sort of thoughts about yeah. why, why we might have this diversity problem and attracting people into conservation? Well, have you, um, what have you done to improve it? Um, I, I think there are quite a lot of sort of individual sort of smaller schemes for getting uh, like young, young people, uh, re recent emerging conservators into, um, into positions, but it's... Have you approached the schools? Have you, um, you know, because schools um, is, is where the potential, um, you know, em employees are, mm. employees. And the fact is that, you know, when one then asks people what they've done or what outcomes have you set yourself? You know, if you don't set outcomes, then in fact, you're not serious. Because you're not saying we're going to try and improve our diversity by 2% or 1%. And we're going to try and look at strategies how we can do that. Because you cannot change, you cannot change or manage properly something you can't measure. And therefore, unless you have a strategy and you have an outcome and you're going to work to that, then it's not serious. Because just having an equality officer is a fudge. It doesn't do anything. Mm. And, and therefore, you, you say we want to improve that. How, how can we do that? What's our relationship with schools? How is our relationship with universities? Um, I think, because I students think that's are looking for jobs every year. Yeah, I think that's the point. I think maybe it is getting into schools rather than universities, because by the time people have sort of chosen a route in university, it's, it's sort of too late. You want people to know earlier that it's a route you can take when you get to university. Um, 
that's yeah no that's really that's a really good point because i think it is sometimes a bit of a hidden job within within heritage um people know about know, curators but not necessarily about conservators yeah because you know if you if people don't know who you are and what you do um then it's you know you're really not serious mm. um and, and 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 therefore this is what it is you can't just do wishful thinking is there anything I suppose, I mean, do you think that there would be a perception that there were barriers to get into working in heritage? Not necessarily. The fact is that is people don't know. For example, yeah. with the police um, in the 60s, they, you know, I was doing some work with them and they didn't have a lot of people who were graduates in the police. And they, you know, you know, we, I suggested, why don't you join the other people who, are, who, who come in towards the end of term um, or coming to ends of people, end of careers and whatnot and do sessions like with other people advertising yourself. And the fact is they started to do that and they now have a significant amount of graduates. Mm. These people sometimes have no idea what yep. somebody who, who is... In, in your in your business, it, you know, it, it's even if it's a career. Yeah. They have no idea. Um, and I think you either write articles, you, um, um, you know, it's, it's communication and advertising yourself. And yeah. the, the point is that, you know, I've spoken to, it's not to whatever, you know, chairman of very big companies and they're saying the same as you, but what is, the people at the top of your business doing. Hmm. So it's all very, very helpful food for thought. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And okay. we've got one from Lorraine that is quite specific. So okay. uh, this is very specific, but you, you know. Uh, so thank you very much for your wonderful and thought provoking talk. I wondered how you felt about Richard Drax MP inheriting the Drax estate in Barbados. <laughs> And how might we, as society, break these inheritances when the roots lie in slavery? The trouble is, you see, the what I said, which we, we, we probably haven't considered, Drax got his estate legally. Yeah. It, like you said what, about trafficking versus slave yeah, trade as terminology. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, the slave trade was legal. Yeah. And therefore, Drax's estate, he got it legally. And the point is that we therefore have to look at our society, which is capable of making laws, which enslave people as property. And that's where we're coming from. And therefore just taking his estate away, we might as well knock down the gallery of modern art or close a lot of the streets in the new town, or in fact, you know, dig up the necropolis or in fact, close Oswald Street or Glassford Street or, you know, um, you know what I mean, in terms of Gr Greenock, you know, um, which was the main sugar port at, at that time. So the point is that that almost sounds like revenge on somebody. And I think, yeah, that might be quite justified, but we have a society as a whole where we're all beneficiaries of this slavery, not just drags. And, and we are all, in fact, involved, are more concerned about racial attitudes and how we treat other people, why we don't have representation and why, in fact, you know, the police still act in that way to, to, to black people or black kids are being excluded from schools to a greater degree and why some people still think Negroes are inferior to whites. Just getting rid of the, the, the drugs they stayed is like taking a statue down. It's a diversion. Mm. Actually, um, I'm sorry, Chris has just made a really interesting point here as a German. Yeah. Um, she says that um, as a German, I can't help looking at parallels with the Holocaust. Germany decided to conserve the evidence of the Holocaust so that we can learn from history and prevent repetition. But mm. that meant that it obliterated, it, they also obliterated all statues and Nazi emblems so as not to revere those responsible do you think that was wrong yes it was wrong it's not about revering you see this is it we we put a spin on it 
it, it's the fact is when people say that to me, the, the society, yes, kept some of the concentration camps, but they didn't want to be reminded of the statute of, of that society. And they, they have a right, that's their right. You know, it's about like opinion. They wanted them down. Why did they take them? I can tell you, a lot of people would rather Dundas' statue down than that plaque on it. Mm. Which actually yes, that, that is what, true. That is true. A lot of people would, yes. So um, taking things down is removing the evidence, as I said, to remove the deed. And we mustn't do that. Not We must conserve in terms of to, it's part of our society. That's how we, we lived. And it, it's as important as our literature. And I suppose the idea that we're putting, that putting something on a plinth elevates it isn't necessarily, that's our, that's us putting that perception on it. And so it's not necessarily that it's being revered. It's there to make you think about whatever yes. it might be. So a statue of Henry Dundas, you don't have to see it as a memorial to Dundas, who, as you said, was, was reviled in his own time. Um, but you know that it is um, you know we use it we can also see it as a memorial to the half a million people that can you know, that were enslaved because that's of right. his actions um, that's yes it. that's really interesting thank you so yeah no thank problem I, th <laughs> I think i think everybody's everybody's got a lot of food for thought there's a lot of um messages and uh, comments so you know thanking you you know you've made some really oh, thank you very much comments um everybody's very touched that you shared your personal story um you described the key people in your education with great kindness and positivity yes. um fiona says i hope i can become more culture conscious and help preserve the deeds of the past in order to understand their context more fully uh, your concept that removing the evidence will not remove the deed should guide how we approach reinterpretation of past events and their glorification in statues. So as you say, actually, are they being glorified? That's us transferring, tran uh, you know, pro projecting that onto, onto them. Um, but I know for me, this has been a really, really interesting evening. Uh, I always learn so much whenever you speak. Um, and Thank I'm you. sure that everyone in the audience is, is giving you a virtual kind of uh, applause, um, but thank you thank so you. much for your time, Sir Jeff. We really, really appreciate it. And um, yes, if anybody is in Edinburgh, uh, do swing past the um, the monument uh, in uh, St Andrew's Square and admire the plaque that took a ridiculous amount of work to get. It's a really small plaque for the amount of work. Right. You, want to, you want it to be giant for the amount of uh, work that, that took. But, but it's, a, it's, only the, it's only a first step, but it's great that we've, we've had that first step. And a lot of that is because of um, uh, the persistence uh, uh, of this gentleman that has spoken to us this evening. So thank you very much, Sir Jeff. Yes. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you evening. very much, when, and you know, uh, uh, other people's rights are in your hands. That's a scary responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.